Okay. Well, folks, today I think we can uh, uh, get through this in, by 1 o'clock. And then what I'd like to do is at 1 meet with those of you who are going to the, the uh, conference with us next week. We need to finalize some details. Okay. Um, today is hopefully a fun day. Of course, that sort of implies that other days aren't in here. <laughs> a more fun day. Okay, a more fun day. I'll use your terminology. Yes. Because today, um, I really like to hear from you, and I imagine you like to hear from others what you know what you used in your abstract this week as Garfink as a um, application of Garfinkel's you know methodology. Okay, I'll say a couple things first. Let, let, let's first talk just for you know no more than about ten to fifteen minutes on what is he really suggesting we should do then as a social investigator um, to better understand the world around us. If you take Schutz's um, theoretical framework and you take, basically Garfinkel embraced all, you know, most, <laughs> the vast majority, if not all, of Schutz's theoretical framework, right? You saw that, okay? If, if you embrace that, Garfinkel says, this poses some interesting measurement problems, though, for us social investigators. Okay? And he's not, he's not suggesting that this is unmeasurable stuff. He's just saying it's more difficult to measure much of what we need to than maybe we had previously thought. Okay? So his approach to just um, uh, some systematic observation. You know, when, when you take methods with me or if you take methods with some, you know, another person in our department, one of the, con what of, one of the underlying um, assumptions that should be made very clear to you about the scientific model is that systematic observation is a must, as opposed to haphazard unsystematic, you know, being hap haphazard observation, okay? So Garfinkel's saying, how are we going to introduce some systematic observation that allows us to measure what we really need to measure if we think this theory works, this theory about so uh, uh, society, social groups works? All right. So what are some, key, what did you see as key points that Garfinkel makes about the assumptions that we need to approach investigation with and then maybe some of the things really he provides a little bit of a cookbook on the key concepts you need to watch for as you observe. What did you see here on these questions? Key things we need to look for as we observe. You know, of course, embracing this theoretical framework, this social constructionist or phenomenological framework that we've been talking about. There are things that people take for granted that others understand. Okay, good. Um, so let's say uh, social actors share a taken for granted uh, definition of reality. Is that uh, consistent with what you're saying? Particularly, um, what kind, what's the quintessential form, uh, or I should put it this way, what, is the, what types of uh, interacting social actors 
we'll have the highest taken for granted definition of reality. There's a term I asked you to think about that came out of Schutz's writing. Yes, Olivia. Consociates. And what are consociates? Those who are in direct contact with the social actor have more of a direct influence on the social Okay, keep going. With those the we relationships. Say that again. The we relationship. Okay, good. Why is a we relationship um, a definitional, or why why is a we relationship so important for distinguishing consociates from just associates? They're mutually involved in one another's uh, biographic. They are growing older together. They they live, mm -hmm. as we may call it, in a pure we relationship. Okay. And have you taken marriage and family yet? What do you talk about in terms of couples getting to know one another and how well they know one another over time? What, what kinds of things do you remember talking about from, from uh, you know, your readings there, your discussion in class? Sort of like the stages of love. And things like that, like there's the infatuation and all that stuff. Like, okay. It changes as you know, things like that. What's the, what, if, okay, good, let's just take that for a second. What is one of the end stages, or in, in that, that stages of love, what is the, what is the uh, late stage, what, is, what do late stages look like? They're How are they different from early stages? The early stages is, are like, um, like there's always like one that, I don't know, like the end stages, they're more equal. Like it, it becomes more of a mutually like working. I don't, I don't even know. What I'm Others? What do you, I mean, help, help Sarah out here. She was brave enough to say, oh yeah, stages of love, that kind of pertains. They're well, like past the point of like figuring each other out and now they're like sort of learning from each other or growing together. Okay. Growing together is kind of an interesting way to put it. Uh, uh, if you study death and dying, this is another way to look at it. What happens when a spouse dies to the, the surviving spouse? What kinds of things do they go through? Grief. Grief. Okay. Uh, <laughs> When you have, um, I mean, from the marriage literature, and, and not just marriage, but of course, it doesn't matter if you're long-term relationship literature. Being formally recognized by the state as a married couple doesn't really matter. It's, it's you know, it's a literature on what happens to those engaged, or uh, in, uh, uh, yeah, engaged in a long-term relationship with one another. They, be, they, they grow together is kind of how you put it, okay? So once you're past the early stages, the literature is very clear on this. You don't talk necessarily. One of the things we've noticed is you don't talk about everything. You don't have to describe everything in, in nearly as much detail in order to effectively communicate, right? right? That's one thing. Part of that is because you were sort of growing together. The shared biography is so, so important for a consociate, okay? And, and really, there's a continuum here. So if you want to think of it this way, as sort of a continuum, uh, say, all social actors. And remember, I'm using actors because what, what can an actor be? Is an actor just an individual? No. Okay, thank you. It's, it is any social acting unit, which could be a dyad. <laughs> It could be that couple, it could be a organization, it could be a, I mean, kind of stretches it maybe a little bit, you know, it could be a nation state, all right, as a social actor. Social actors have this continuum of shared experience, you know, where we say extremely shared, to no shared. Experience. Well, 
own sakes. We'll put experience up here. Okay, so if we, have, if we can think of it this way, there's this continuum of shared experience from being extremely high to extremely low, and I, I could have, I sh probably should have made it vertical and make it more illustrative of, of this, but think of this as having very high shared experience at this end to very low. Where do consociates fall? Well, by definition, they're right here. Okay? They're, they define this end of the continuum, and that's why I was trying to get across. Now, how do old married couples represent this? They, they live together day in, day out. They, they've gone through the shared experience often of raising kids, of going to uh, leisure activities together, of going through um, uh, trying, you know, very trying times together, multiple kinds of things, conflict, I mean, you know, couple conflict to, uh, you know, health problems, uh, threats to the, the social actor, the acting unit here being the couple. I mean, they've gone through all this. So some studies uh, of surviving spouses show this. This is, this is incredible to me, but I can, under, I, I can understand it. Studies have shown that a surviving spouse actually can lose part of their memory at the death of, uh, upon the death of, of their, uh, their spouse, their partner, longtime partner. Why? Well, psychologists kind of refer to it this way. There's what they call a transactional memory or a space of memory that is shared experience. And when the partner's gone, you don't have it anymore. You can actually construct things together. I mean, think about this way. You've, we're going to have to talk through some of it in, in a little bit. Maybe it'll come up in some of your examples. But you've watched your grandparents probably interact, right? And they'll say things to one another, seem to be effectively communicating, and you're going, what? what they just talk about? I don't get it. And so you say, Oh, you know, Grandma, what did you mean by, or what did you mean by, okay? And then they, they articulate it more for this, for this non-consociate observer. Well, essentially, that's what Garfinkel says we all are as social investigators. We are the non-consociate observers having to sort of, you know, through, through good investigation, push our way into that interaction in a way that at least allows us to understand it better, okay? So anyway, the, the, part, uh, the part about transactional memory is a little off point, but I, uh, uh, to sum that up, it's kind of understandable, it's very understandable, I think it's intuitive to me, that when a spouse dies, especially, you know, if a couple's been together, I mean, basically the longer they've been together, the probably the more this tends to be the case up to the point where senility or dementia or something sets in, um, you create a shared reality. We're using this theory now. You create a shared reality. When part of that social, socially acting unit, that couple, is gone, there is a part of reality that leaves. Think about this. How often have you seen your grandparents or even your parents finish thoughts for one another. You, you know what I mean? Everybody kind of familiar with that? One of them starts to say something and the other one finishes the thought. When the spouse is gone, one of them starts the thought and there's nobody to finish it. And over time, you actually create a pattern. I mean, this is getting into couple studies and stuff. Basically an area that is not of my expertise. but. Um, I just have enough familiarity with the literature that it, it, it makes a lot of sense. And it's very, I mean, it makes a lot of sense in the context of this theorizing, okay? All right, back to this. So social actors share taken for granted definition of reality. And we've worked this out a little bit here that at one end is extremely shared. And at the other end, what would be an example of no shared reality? 
is there any is there any such thing on, in our globe of no shared reality between two actors that come into contact? No, because at the very least, I mean, as uh, Murphy could say they're sharing, like even if you know you're just standing in line behind somebody, you're still sharing the community of space, right? And, and time, like you're still, or does there have to be specific interaction? What do you think? Is there such a thing as no shared? Well, this kind of gives it away. Okay, I would say I would say yeah, we can envision such things as no shared reality. Think about now it's it gets I think every year that passes and the more global our communication systems become probably in general as a trend it becomes more and more difficult to conceive of interactions that are absent of any shared reality, but imagine a Brazilian rainforest tribe, of which there are still a few, that are quite isolated. If you picked one of them up, set them down here with us in this class today, I would bet you that they would have a, an extreme sense of displacement, of uncertainty, uh, just in general, no basis on which to define the situation. Remember our model that we had on the board on Tuesday? They would have little to no basis to arrive at a shared definition of the situation. I mean, it would be so cursory as something like this, Sally. We would say, oh, we don't know how to interact with them, with that person. And that person would be thinking, I don't know what to do around these people or who they are, what to do. I don't know, I don't know what's next. Okay? So, so that may be that may be a shared, shared that may be a shared remember no. But we gotta think of the model this way. Remember there were three parts. All of these contribute to definition of uh, interpretation of this specific situation that you're in, okay? Which then leads to uh, uh, Okay, remember? Everything, all social acting behavior, all, all, this is redundant, all social actor behavior, all social actor behavior is filtered through this, an immediate definition of the situation. That's what Schutz told us on, when we talked about that on Tuesday a little bit. We may not have said it exactly that way, but that's, that's the model. Over here was what? Social experience, right? And we said we'll allow social experience to also include knowledge. Okay, take, and then we have this other thing, bubble that we call values, beliefs about the world. Now, are these technically absolutely separate? No, they're not. So I don't really care where this goes. I think it could be, some knowledge could be thought of far more as experience. Others may be just as cursory as a belief, okay? Like a, like a, a, a theological belief with no experience tied to the knowledge, really, all right? A faith belief, okay? It doesn't matter, but these are the three things that contribute to that immediate definition of the situation which contributes to social action, okay? That, that's just a refresher from Tuesday. Yeah? So the Brazilian from the Amazon that we set in the classroom, would that be, would that fall under like a new situation for that Brazilian? Absolutely. Okay. And we're both in a new situation, but then once actually. once that new situation takes place, then we all have a shared experience, right? Like even if we don't understand each other, we're still interacting. Okay. We still so, have it. so I don't, I guess I don't Let's really get know. another point up here.
Garfinkel makes this point. We need to understand as investigators that there is a temporally progressive understanding that develops through social interaction. So it, it, I think it pertains to what your question here, Sally. Yeah, after we've had some time with one another, then what happens? We've got this, okay? But this is all, think of it this way. This is time one. This is merely our, our little diagram for time one right now. This whole thing resets at time two. And things can like switch around because what was once a new situation becomes a past experience. Yeah. So like, Mm -hmm. Make sense? Does that make sense to you? Okay. So, I mean, a way to think about it is the, the new situation at time one becomes a shared experience at time two. What exactly is the gradation between time one and time two? How much time? That's all arbitrary. That, you know, that's for empirical, empirical um, study, examination. We don't know what makes the most sense. I mean, if you're in a fire, I'm guessing the time frames become quite small in terms of what is social, using this theory, what becomes socially operative here. You know, that new situation immediately, quickly, very quickly, within seconds, maybe minutes, becomes a shared experience. And then you have the next phase of shared experience. You know what I mean? So could it be, I don't know, this is maybe even off topic, but like the more like severe to your survival the new situation, like the quicker you'll move along the gradient line? Yeah, I'm a, that might be a general principle that we should test. We may, we may have a fascinating hypothesis right there, Haley, that we as a class ought to go test. We may, add, we, we may, we may, yeah, we may significantly add, oh yeah, yeah, I don't think I want to test it personally. I mean, <laughs> test though as an investigator, okay, more as an investigator. That's just kind of an interesting idea. I don't know if that's in this literature or not. It'd be interesting in the hazards literature to kind of apply to apply this theorizing. How fast, basically, it's kind of a question of how fast can social learning take place under conditions of duress? Yeah, basically, that's it. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, well, let me see if there's anything else among uh, that we kind of need to discuss before we just as background to so make sure we're all on the same page. Do we understand really what he says we need to observe as social investigators? Watch for. What should we watch for in order to obtain accurate uh, observations? Okay. I, I think we've, I think we through what we've talked about, I think we, we're, we're ready to go here. Um, essentially, we have to interrupt reality, don't we? I mean, using his method. Garfinkel says, a productive method of studying the social world is for us, as an investigator, to kind of interrupt the taken-for-granted definition of reality going on in, a, in an interaction. Okay? So, what did you put... What did some of you, or you know, feel free to chime in, whoever's ready to go first. What did you have in your abstract as an example of this? Okay. Um, I really wasn't sure if I did this right, but I used the bar scene, like an, a, a foreign observer observing the bar scene. Okay. Um, so observing a bar scene, all right. Like the, well, I, I, I honestly had a hard time what he was talking about, so I don't even know if I, like when you said describe it analytically, I just tried to describe it without assigning any relevance to anything. Like I mentioned, um, well, like I didn't say bar scene, I said um, the social bar environment, you know, like the socialization that seems to take place, like at a bar, that the same kind of socialization would take place as frequently outside of that. Like I mm -hmm. included something about um, 
how it seems that many people go into this environment looking for mates. Okay. We talked about that before, but I really mm -hmm. wasn't sure how okay. it was supposed to be. Did anyone use something that you are, in, you know, very familiar with? I see several of you going, yeah, yeah. I mean, not that you're not familiar with the bar scene. You may be. I'm not, I don't mean to suggest you're not, for better or for worse. I'm not. I'm, but did anyone use something that kind of, I guess, you find yourself in daily? And then go, huh, that's kind of weird. Why do I do it this way? Yeah. Go I ahead. did. I use my work routine. Okay. Like, because I'm a CNA, so I, like, talked about how we go to the shower rooms, we get the commodes, we go to room 310, we start there. Why do we start there in that room? And then we say, like, we go to the closet, we pick out the clothes. How do we know what the residents oh, want to yeah. wear? Okay. But we, we know that a foreigner wouldn't know why we know what we do because we, just with interacting with the residents, we know what they like to wear and what they don't like to wear. And um, like asking them, are you ready to get up? Okay. They know what it means, but a foreigner would be like, are they ready to get up for a short period of time? Um, oh, okay, so let me ask you this then. I'm gonna pretend like I'm that foreigner. Uh, Chastity, what, what, when, you, when, she, when she responded, yes, she's ready to get up, what does she really mean? She's ready to get up for the day, to start her day, to get dressed, to get toileted, to go and eat, to do all the things that she does in her normal day. Okay. And so, and then I talked about like, so we sit her up on the side of the bed, will both of us help her get up? Well, how do we know that she can't walk? Mm -hmm. Like, how do we know that we have to assist her? Right. Well, we just know, I mean, we just take that stuff. Uh -huh. How you did know? you come to know the, the you know, physical limitations or abilities, however you want to put it, of that particular resident, the, the fictitious one we're talking about here. How did you come to know? Um, I, I come to know by like training and seeing other people, but also we have like um, charts, charts and stuff that we can read about the residents. Yeah. But um, just like when a new patient comes in, I mean, we kind of, we don't know much and either uh -huh. does the administration. Yes. So we, it's kind of like, you have to play around with the situation yes. to see what works well. Is two people with the gate ball going to work better mm -hmm. or is a lift mm -hmm. going to work better for them? Mm -hmm. So it's just, you kind of just have to play around with the situation yeah. until, you, until they are comfortable and you're comfortable with the situation. Yeah. What kinds of messages do you see, do you see on the charts? Right. Like, like a, uh, somebody's figured something out about resident A and like, so they go to resident A's chart, the new resident, resident mm -hmm. A, we're pretend, you know, what kinds of information would you see on a chart? Um, T tell me see, what's said, what's actually the text written on there. Um, you would see like, um, like it would say like they have, they have dent dentures, mm -hmm. like they need to be toileted at this time, like say like seven, seven, like 11, and okay. you know, just certain things like that. And like, do they need assist with washing their face, their hands, brushing their teeth? I mean, okay. we just, we get that information. Okay. And Have you ever found that information to not be as full as you would have liked when yeah. you show up? How so? Um, some of it can be like misleading. Because it's like saying, like sometimes it says like resident could needs two people with gait belt. No, it's not like that. Resident needs lift because <laughs> okay. I will hurt myself if I try to. Ah. So there needs to be more clarification. Yeah. Uh, two people who uh, can um, deadlift a certain amount of pounds together <laughs> could do this, but yeah. that level of detail is not on the chart. What is this then, using Garfinkel's, uh, what has just happened here to, to poor Olivia? 
when she goes to the chart and she finds. I'm sorry. Why do I keep? Doing? I know the the different. What has happened to poor chastity here? Between uh, you know the time that somebody wrote something on a chart and she shows up to do something, what she's a victim of what? So basically, they want us to just maybe you're like a victim. Take for granted okay, so have. maybe you're, what you are is partially a victim of a taken for granted assumption that we all understand and perceive the same way. That we would define common sense, you know, the same way always. Maybe you're a victim of that. Uh, my point here is that. Boy, my glad medicine has charts, okay? Because if it didn't, it would be even more fraught with um, taken for granted assumptions that are inaccurate and will result in less effective care than if they were accurate, okay? But even the charts are not complete, right? There's, there's things that like I do for residents that I know that they like, I know what they like and what they don't uh, like. That's sure. not in the chart. Yeah. That's yeah. not going to tell somebody, like the chart isn't going to tell the new CNA how they can get along with Good. You know, that resident. Yeah. yeah. So. Now you're really speaking to the, the art of effective interaction really aren't you? I mean, you're saying, when you say, well, let me ask, tell me what you mean by um, won't know all the little things that work. Um, they won't know, like, how she wants, or he or she wants to, how they want the pillow put under their, their, their legs, or how they want to get wrapped up mm -hmm. in the blankets, or how they want to, um, you know, do their, how do they want you to brush their hair mm -hmm. with a pick or a comb? And what are the social consequences of not knowing? They get very upset with you. <laughs> good, good. Thank you for, for bringing, this is a real, this isn't fictitious. I mean, I mean, yeah, the person is fictitious that we talked about, the, but this is what you really do, right? Yeah, I appreciate it. Others, what'd you put down or what'd you write about? Um, I talked about how, like, different phrases, basically, uh -huh. like, um, whenever people come in to, like, the store, they'll be like, oh, it's crazy out there, like, it's a, it's an icebreaker type mm -hmm. thing, mm -hmm. and, like, I know that they're talking about, like, oh, the weather, it must be really windy because I've been out previously that day, okay. or it must be really raining or whatever, but, like, to someone who's new to this situation, they may, might think, like, what do they mean by out there? Oh, yeah. Like out in the universe, yeah. outside, <laughs> out like in a different part of the store, uh -huh. and like the like the phrasing crazy. Do they think like it's literally like a mentally challenged out there, or you know like <laughs> they don't know exactly what it good. means by the the phrasing crazy? So yeah, that's good. what I use because people. Yeah. I mean like just like simple things like icebreakers. <laughs> it's just something you say to someone yes. to kill time, like in between. Uh huh. Uh -huh. So. Good. Good. And you, you, so you work at a store where you come into contact with a lot of people you don't know. Right. I'm but you, Walmart. what's interesting is you still find these common phrases, right? That yeah. Are, that we culturally now, what becomes the the important consociate here? In other words, that that phrase, boy, it's crazy outside, mm -hmm. conveys meaning, and we can probably we can probably. Um, we, it's again, it's a matter of empirical testing. We could do this. But we can probably fairly val validly as assume that the vast majority of folks who come through there would share the same interpretation. Right. Okay? So now what has become the interesting, again, it's not a continuum, but what becomes now the interesting social group that has some shared meaning? This local culture, maybe? Yeah. Okay, at least that, mm -hmm. right? You may go to California and say the same thing, and they'd be going, what? 
What do you mean it's crazy? Yeah. Or just like when people are like, I don't know, like this, I just thought it was something It was like when you go someplace to get like a drink, uh -huh. and you're like, oh, I want to go get a pop. Uh huh. Like different regions are like, what are you talking about? Yeah. Like if you say Coke, like if, if someone would say, I'm going to go get a Coke, to me, I think they're getting Coca Cola. Yeah. But they might think, like, just that's what they call it is go get a Coke. Yeah, that very good example. I mean, in the part of the world where I was raised, it was, it was a go get a Coke. And we understood that to be, it could be any kind of pop. Right. So where, where are you from? Colby. Mm -hmm. Others, what did you use? I use um, like an African, like a remote village African going to Walmart for the first time. So oh, okay. It kind of goes along with that. But um, I just talked about how like everyone was pushing large metal baskets that were coming out of the store and everybody going into the <laughs> store was like empty handed, but everybody's in a hurry. Mm -hmm. And like the minute you walk in, there's this person not doing anything, which would be crazy in Africa to have like a worker just standing there. Just standing there. Hi. Hello. And like, yeah. <laughs> and just talked about how like this overly happy man in uniform not doing anything greeted me. And then I got an <laughs> empty card that didn't have anything in it. And like I didn't understand why everybody else already had plastics in their baskets oh, yeah. and then the example that yeah. I use which this could be used for a lot of things but like the person I had him like with a foreigner like a, a national here but that they needed hair soap shampoo but they needed hair soap and there were so many choices and the Africans so overwhelmed because why are there like a hundred different types and yeah. the other thing that I pointed out was like this would be crazy to any African, but that you buy your food, your clothing, your grass, like, you buy your grass, but all this stuff in one location, like, mm -hmm. that would just be mm. unbelievable. So, I don't know if that's, like, it wasn't, I wrote it more, like, from first person, like, I was that. Person. And that's okay, by the way, I, I left this quite wide open, okay, but you get the point. I yeah. can tell from your answer that you, you are, you are, uh, uh, you, you have a, uh, interpreted this from a social actor standpoint that shows you understand what Garfinkel's saying. And there was an example in the reading that he, he talks about, like, the short man walks in and kisses the older woman and says hi to the younger women and, like, speaks in foreign language and talks about what they want to eat or something like that. And so I was like, well, maybe it's okay to write from first person. No, no, no it's fine, yeah. I'm, I, what I basically wanted to see was that you could analyze a situation as though it's extremely odd. It, it, you, you start questioning what we would consider the, the taken for granted assumptions. And one of the best ways to do it is writing it from the perspective truly of a foreign observer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what did you do, Hallie? Did you, um, I, you? You nodded a minute ago when you said, when I asked, I did anybody apply it to their own experience? Uh, going to Tanzania. Okay. Mm -hmm. And like how just being in a completely different culture, like we um, a lot of times would revert back to our past experience in America and like think that that was what you're supposed to do, but mm -hmm. then like the people, like it completely wasn't. And uh, mm -hmm. I just, I didn't say this one in my, uh, in here, but I just thought of it. We had a translator this summer um, and she did actually didn't speak all that well English, which mm -hmm. was kind of... <laughs> Uh, not easy, and she was explaining this game. It's like African like dodgeball to us, and like um, <laughs> she kept saying, "He's like, you must beat, you must beat to win," and you're like, "Beat? You have to beat the person? <laughs> <laughs> what?" Uh, she meant like yeah. you're like hit. They're like, "Oh yeah, yeah, hit." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like you have to beat this person yeah. to win this game. And just like, I just talked about a few uh. other experiences like and how actually some of the people could have gotten really offended uh -huh. by the things we did, but they did it because they saw we were white, and so they just laughed at us. So they, they, gave, you some, <laughs> they gave you some real social room, didn't they? Yeah. I mean, using Garfinkel's sort of concept, uh, conceptual framework, and Schutz's as well. Basically, they, they gave you some social room because they knew you didn't have the same social experience, values, beliefs that they did. They, they know. I mean, we're generally globally aware enough now, even if you, well, you're, you're aware, even a very closed, well, I'll put it this way, a very closed, non-globally 
interconnected group realizes a stranger. In fact, they may realize a stranger far quicker than anyone else. I mean, the globally interconnected groups. And so we get some social room, which is, I'm not sure he really talks about that much, but it's, it certainly has some, there's some very interesting interpretations using this theory of, of, that, of that new situation. Wow, they, get, they basically, the rules go out the window, right? To some extent. Yeah, they in say, other well, cases where they would have been really offended by, like, it's a very relational culture, so if you know someone mm -hmm. and, like, you don't stop and talk for at least five minutes, it's rude. Yeah. It doesn't matter, like, what you're doing, you have to stop. Yeah. And, uh, like, we just say hi, you know, and keep going, because yeah. that's what we do in right. America. <laughs> right. And so... Oh, uh -huh. you just brought up a very interesting thing that normally we talk about when, or I used to talk about a lot with you students when we discuss simul, some urban rural differences in, in the United States, right here in good old Kansas, even. Um, there is a, an expectation um, in rural Kansas communities, I would argue, of the same kind of interaction. It is rude to go through the checkout line at your local grocery store without asking the, the person checking you out, oh, how's your, how's your son, how's your daughter, how's your mother, how's your father, whatever, you know, whatever the case may be. It's, it is rude not to strike up at least a minimal uh, conversation with them. But in, in Hayes, America, you, you go right to the checkout and maybe don't exchange a word with the checker. Or waving when you're driving. Yeah, exactly. That's like everybody in like small town Kansas, like you everybody waves at you. You don't know who they are, they wave at you. People are like I if you take someone from this city. small town and everybody's getting like waving yeah. at the And wheel. everyone's like, Hey, do you know them? Do you not no, I don't know them, but everybody's like <laughs> Yeah. I I lived for six years outside of this region, and I always knew I was getting close to home when I would drive back and the fingers start going up yeah, as I pass people on the highway. Keshki, what did you put down? What did you talk about? I put myself in my behavior in my apartment. I always take off my shoes in front of my room. I never go into my room with my shoes. Ah. Yeah. That's because my it's my cult at least Japanese culture. Yes. We always take off shoes in front of the main entrance ah. and then go inside the house. Okay. Yeah. So the shoes are actually left outside the door. Yeah. And that would that 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 is odd. I mean what do you do at a single household? I mean or like when you approach I'm sorry, let me put it this way. When you approach someone's house in Japan and you knock on the door. Do you knock on the door? Yeah. Doorbells? Yeah. Um, when do you take your shoes off? At what point? I wouldn't know when to take my shoes off. No. <laughs> yeah, you can demonstrate. May entrance. Uh -huh. We have the particular area okay. near the entrance. Everybody is expected to take your take shoes off here at this point. Okay. At this time. Then go inside. Ah. So actually, we have some the different level in front of the main entrance, uh -huh. like this this height. Okay. So it means you have to take your shoes off. Yeah. Anytime. Right there. Yeah. Do you step up yeah, or step down? Up. Step, step up. up. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. Anyone travel to Japan? I haven't either. See, and we would be, and this is a perfect application of Garfinkel. This is, we talked about a little bit on Tuesday. When you encounter a new culture, there's a whole lot of shared meaning that, that uh, the various con uh, uh, co-present actors are using that you're just unaware of, right? And so you can, you run the risk of violating, offending. Now, the good news is, the vast majority of the time, I think the respective culture whose uh, territory you're entering, again, con concedes that, well, this is a new person, uh, this person doesn't understand our, our rules. But you, if you stay there over time, you're expected to learn them and honor them much of the time. And this, this has all kinds of applications, by the way, when we talk about this in methods class, when we talk about doing field research, okay? And this, this form of research that he is describing in this chapter 
is very much a field kind of research. You're, you're interacting with the social actors you're studying in their own environment. That's basically the definition of field research. You had some. Uh, well, first, Sally. Oh, I was hand. just going to say, um, like in France, mm -hmm. if you ask for your food different than how it is on the menu, like if you ask for some sauce to not be on it or whatever, they get upset. Uh, really? Or if you, if you go in, like we were in a big group, and so we'd go to eat at a restaurant, and two of the girls, they didn't want to spend their money at the restaurant, so they just wanted to sit and have a glass of water, and that's considered extremely rude uh -huh. if you go into mm -hmm. a restaurant. And even if you're with people who are uh -huh. eating, if you're not eating. Really? Like, yeah, uh -huh. that is not our, um, we went uh -huh. with Jacques Salian, uh -huh. you know, and he, he, I mean, he told us, he was like, you don't want to do that, that's not, and, and if we, like, wanted stuff, but we didn't want a bunch of, like, different things on it or want to change it in some way or other, like, that was not, you just kind of didn't. That. But over here, I mean, we would never know that if we hadn't had him telling us. Right. Like, because here, I mean, that's kind of what you do. Like, people kind of expect you, it seems yeah. like, to, to tweak your order a little yeah. bit. She's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Heather has to take orders all the time. Uh, yeah, we try a lot of tweaking. Uh, Olivia, what'd you um, use? I just used working at the grade school and how. Like, when the kids come into the gym, they're expected to sit with their grade level oh, okay. in certain lines. And as workers, we just kind of take it for granted that they're going to do that. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes time for snack, like, we clap to get their attention, and they're supposed to repeat it. Oh. And then, like, they know it's always the quiet people that get to go to the tables first. Mm -hmm. So most of them have figured out, like, they realize this. So... They're just learning to get quiet faster. Uh -huh. Yeah, which is a lo very kind of local cultural thing, but very effective. I'm, I'm assuming it's very effective in yeah. terms of um, being reliably communicated. In other words, yeah. the kids. you said the kids figure it out fast. Yeah, the, like the older ones mostly. And like the kindergartners that hadn't been there before, a couple weeks into the program, they realized that that was why other people got to go in front of them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll reveal a little bit of personal experience on this. My son is among the kids that Olivia watches, uh, tends to, I guess, in this after-school care thing. And so I can give you a little bit of insight from his perspective. He came home one day very disappointed. And I said, Alan, what's wrong? You know, oh, I don't, I don't, he did, I don't, you know, he, he, first you could tell he, he didn't want to talk about it. And then we just come to find out that he wasn't picked among the first that day to go get the snack because he claims, of course, some other kid that he was sitting by kept trying to talk to him. And he was trying to ignore whatever, he, so he claims. And the person, it wasn't you, by the way. He, 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 said, he actually named, the, I mean, he, he said who it was, you know, it wasn't you, who, who said, no, you can't go right now because you were talking. So he was just crushed because he had, and we talked about, well, you know, people may have not seen it. Um, you do, you know, you, we talked about how you just have to sit very silently and, and you know, just ignore that kid who's trying to talk to you or whatever. Anyway, the point, the whole point here is um, they do effectively learn that pretty fast and it becomes a local cultural thing or the way we put it here is there's a taken, there's a shared definition of reality now among that group, okay? And that definition of reality is, is what you all hope to instill, right? I mean, because you want them to behave. One way to get them to behave is to offer them incentive. One of the incentives is get to have snack first. How do you get that? How, how do you get that snack? By behaving. What does behaving mean? In this case, it means sitting still and being quiet. So, pretty effective, too. Heather, I haven't heard from you. Um, I just did working at Gutches and how, like, when you first start working there, you have to go through training and you have to have someone help you. So you have to go up to a table with someone and be like, oh, this is. Chelsea, she's just starting to work here, she's learning the ropes, you know, whatever. Uh -huh. Well, after a certain amount of time, you kind of just learn what goes on at work, 
and you have certain things that you have to do, like say like I'm the only one left that has a table. Everyone else is going to be working on getting the stuff done so that they can leave, which mm -hmm. is common sense for them because they're not going to be able to leave until everything's done. Okay. So that's kind of what we talked about. And an observer might wonder... What's going on? Why are all these people still here if there's just one table here? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, you know, um, some of the most interesting movies most entertaining movies, I and mean, sometimes, often they're comedies. What is comedy often? Comedy is sort of exposing some of the hilarity in, in our, taken, our everyday taken for granted assumptions about the world, isn't it? And some of the more interesting documentaries are ones that expose us to different cultures where there's simply a different shared meaning. Now, I, before we wrap up, I don't want you to think that this is just cultural analytics here. I mean, Garfinkel and Schutz said, hey, even the, even the, 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 the uh, acting units that are consociates, the, the quintessential forms of consociates, even we should look for them to have missteps in terms of the shared meaning and we can watch for that, okay? Um, it, it doesn't simply mean that we're always going to interpret something the same way simply because we share a same definition of reality in general, okay? I have a friend that yeah. she'll say, I'm waxed and that means she's tired. But like, I didn't know that. And everybody's like, you're what? Like, and she's from Kansas, and she's like, I'm so waxed. And everybody's like, what do you mean? Make me got your eyebrows waxed? <laughs> yeah, we're like, I don't know where that's going. But it's like something her family says, and so, like, she just said it yeah. in a group, and everybody's like, uh, is everything okay? <laughs> well, thanks for putting an exclamation point on my general principle I just said there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Everybody's from Kansas, but... Well, it also drives, to me, it drives on one more point, something that I always say to folks. You know what? Even as we become increasingly a mass, society, a mass uh, culture, I mean, we're, we're, if we want to be, we can be quite aware, aware of the day-to-day -day goings on in Japan without ever having to visit because of so much media coverage and that sort of thing. And now webcams that are, you know, uh, and, and, uh, and with the presence of the Internet, individual citizens in Japan can log on and put their ideas up and we can read those with no filters in between. We can do that now, okay? And vice versa. But even so, I do think that there is still relevance to very local culture. The people in Hoxie have a different shared meaning of reality to some extent than the people in Atwood or Colby. Okay, so, and you have to go in there and look for that as an investigator if, you, if you're doing a community study for sure. Okay. All right, questions, thoughts? Okay, remember that next week, Tuesday, we will come back and, and be prepared to talk about your, your ideas for your term paper. It can be in different stages. I fully expect that. Some will be a long way towards deciding on their topic and their theoretical frameworks. Others may just be kind of trying to settle on the topic and or one of the theoretical frameworks. Just come in ready to talk, though, about I'd like to hear from, from all of you on where you're at and what you're anticipating to, to do. And then next Thursday, Career Services will be here to give you all kinds of good information on how to find a job or get into graduate school when you finish when you finish with us at Fort Hayes. We hate to see you go, but we're also happy for you and want you to be successful. So, and they've got some really. You should. You, the actually the director uh, uh, of uh, career services has a sociology degree. I don't know if any of you know D uh, Dan Rice, but, but he does. Um, and then the week after, we'll be back in here and we'll be moving on to symbolic interactionism. Okay, so no abstracts due next week. Just come to class both days. Uh, first day to talk about paper, second day to basically listen and ask questions. You can ask questions of the career services folks that show up too. Okay. Anything? Any, any questions? All right. 
Very good.